Today we talk about, is it possible to lower your FSH levels? And the second question is, does it matter? I'm Dr. Mark Amos, and this is Taco About Fertility Tuesday. To understand this episode, I think you have to understand why I created this episode, and it had to do with a question a patient brought to me. This patient of mine has premature ovarian failure. Her FSH is above 100, so it's very severe. And she went and saw a specialist in California, and this person put her on estrogen, and then they checked her FSH level again and showed her it was much, much lower. The doctor was ecstatic, even wrote to her and said, this is amazing results. And it was. But the concern was, is that, of course it was. FSH will always go down if you're taking estrogen. But the question means, does it change anything with regards to getting pregnant? Does it improve your chances? of getting pregnant? Does it improve your ability to respond to the medications? And the simple answer to that question is, no, it doesn't. And so I wanted to make a podcast because I thought, to me, because I do this every day, this is a very obvious thing. Having a lower FSH is a good thing on your cycle day three labs, but falsely making it lower and making you feel good does not. So what do I mean by lowering your FSH level? What I mean by that is when someone goes and gets cycle day three labs, meaning blood drawn the third day of their period, we look at two hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, and estrogen, which stands for estradiol. Now, it's really important to have the estrogen level because it actually validates the FSH level. What I mean by that when I say validation is because there's a thing called the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian access, and that works together to release FSH, and then the ovary makes estrogen, and it comes back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary and tells it whether it needs to go up or down. So if you had your FSH level drawn on your third day of your period, but your estrogen level was, let's say, 200, your FSH may be under 10, and everyone goes, great, it's low, but it's not. You probably have a cyst that caused your estrogen level to go high, and that falsely lowered your FSH level, making you think it's better. But in reality, it's useless because the FSH was low while the estrogen level was high. Now, in general, most books will say as long as the estrogen level is below 80 or 80 or below, you can use the FSH levels reliably. I tend to be a little bit more conservative. If it's above 50, I do question a little bit. Meaning, if someone has an FSH level of 9.8 and their estrogen is 25, I feel a lot more comfortable feeling that it is accurate than someone who has an FSH level of 9.8 with an estrogen level of 81. That patient with an estrogen level of 81, I can pretty much assume that if the estrogen was, let's say, 50 or less, it'd probably be a little bit more elevated. So the first point to understand is, is that it is a feedback loop. And so you need both parts of it. If your doctor is only drawing FSH levels, then you're only seeing half the picture and potentially that half may be more important than the first half of the picture. But the second part is, what does it even mean? Does FSH mean that you have bad eggs? Does it mean your egg quality won't be good? Does it mean that you may go into menopause earlier in life? Well, the answer is no. It actually doesn't mean any of those things. Now, there can be associations. If you look at every woman who is 45 years of age, most likely their FSH level is going to be high, being above 10, possibly even above 14. And that also is associated with poor egg quality, but not because of the FSH, but because of the fact that they're 45. Now, there are other women who are going to be very young, who have very high FSH levels, and they will also have poor egg quality, but that is usually due to a reason, such as Turner syndrome or mosaic Turner syndrome or premature ovarian failure where their FSH levels go up very high and they have fewer eggs to work with, respond very poorly, and could also have poor egg quality. 
But it's important to remember that these are outliers. In general, when you have an FSH level that's between 10 and 14, as you go higher up on that number to 14, what you find is people need more medication to get the same response as someone who is using lower medication. So it's more of a measure of how well your ovaries will respond. And if you've actually listened to some of these podcasts in the past, you know I talk about this all the time, that there's a difference between ovarian reserve testing and egg quality and being able to get pregnant. This is also the difference between association and causation. There are associations that occur, but they are not causative. This is why women who end up having poor egg quality use stronger doses of medication. It's not the medication making eggs bad. It's just it takes more medication to be able to get the same amount of eggs. So it's what came first. The eggs weren't bad because of the medications. They were already having a hard time and why it required higher doses. So it's easy then to go, well, then if the FSH is high and they have to use more meds, my eggs are bad. But it doesn't work that way. The FSH being higher just means it takes more medications to get more eggs. The quality of eggs are then determined after you see them in a Petri dish or, as we talked about earlier, based off of age. So the binding concept here is that if the FSH level is higher, it takes more medication to get the same response. And eventually, that FSH can get so high that you don't respond anymore, such as the patient who had the FSH of 100. Even if the FSH is 50, what you will find is that your body is not going to respond to the medication very well, and potentially, you may even be in menopause if you're as high as of the hundreds. However, if you can get someone to ovulate, it technically only takes one egg to get pregnant. And so yes, even with a very high FSH level, where there is some concern about the quality of the eggs, there is still a chance because if you were younger, such as let's say you're 24 with an FSH of 25, there's at least a chance. Now, what I'm saying here is that if you give someone estrogen to lower their FSH level, it doesn't improve anything about the ovarian reserve or the egg quality. There are reasons why you might want to lower the FSH level, which I'm going to go over. But it's important to understand it doesn't change what the meaning means. It's not the FSH level that we care about. It's what it represents. I never look at an FSH level and go, this will never work. Now, I may have my concerns at certain FSH levels, such as 100. But if someone has an FSH level of 11 and someone has an FSH level of 13, there is nothing that says that person with 11 is going to do better than the person with a 13. You have to take the whole concept of how well they've done in the past, their actual follicle count, their AMH level, and their age to be able to really make a decision of what that FSH level means. One of the analogies I like using, I think I've used it before in a prior podcast, but if I didn't, this will be new to you, is the concept of smoke and a building. Meaning, when you see a building on fire, what you see is you see black smoke. And so when white smoke occurs, we all get excited about it because we know the fire is probably close to being out. But that means it's not the smoke we're happy about, it's what the smoke means. Just like if someone took a smoke generator and went in front of the building and made white smoke and started saying, well, why aren't you guys all happy? I'm making the white smoke. We would all look at that person and say, well, it's not the white smoke we care about. It's what the white smoke represents that we care about. Well, that is the same thing with FSH. I don't care about the number. It's what the number represents. Even if you can get it to go down a little bit, with the estrogen level being under 80, it doesn't change the fact that it was elevated when your estrogen levels were at its lowest point. And that's what we care about because if I'm wrong and I go, oh no, things are fine, I would understimulate you and you would actually make fewer eggs and would have a lower chance. So don't let the FSH level define you. Don't feel like it means something. Think of it more as a tool we use to be able to help determine what is the right dosage and protocol for you in that situation. Giving someone estrogen to make the FSH lower is like putting makeup on a bruise. Sure, it looks better, but it doesn't change the fact there's a bruise there, and underneath it is still the same problem. Now, it doesn't mean if your FSH levels are elevated that you shouldn't do things to benefit the eggs. For example, 
even if your FSH level stays high, taking things like CoQ10 and DHEA and other supplements can still benefit your egg quality without changing your FSH level. And so you want to really get out of your head that the FSH is what's holding you back. The FSH is just a measure of how much hormone your brain has to make to make a single egg. And then that lets us know then how much hormone we need to give to make more eggs. Now, you would think then, well, then we should never give anyone estrogen. But the answer is no, we do. And we actually do want to lower the FSH level, but not for the same reason. The goal is not to have an award on our shelf that says, I got my FSH level under 10. The goal of lowering FSH levels with priming is to get increase in upregulation of receptors. And so when you use something like a birth control for a long period of time, you suppress the FSH. And by suppressing it, your body makes more receptors. And as it makes more receptors, what that does is eventually when you bring the FSH back in the form of a stimulation, you will actually get better response because you have now upregulated those receptors. In that situation, it absolutely makes sense to lower the FSH because you're doing it to get a response. So I have patients who have a thing called premature ovarian failure, which is where they're almost in the menopause or may even be in menopause. And I put them on birth control until I get the FSH level under 10. Then I come in with very strong doses of medications and using Femara and force the body to eventually get them to ovulate. And I've been very successful at times with that. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to get pregnant, but it means they at least get a chance because I can get them to ovulate because these women are not even ovulating on their own anymore. In that situation, those are great results. But it's not great because of the fact that I'm surprised the FSH went down. I know the FSH will go down. I can make anybody's FSH drop by giving them enough estrogen. So in that situation where my patient's doctor said, oh, that's amazing results. That's not amazing results. Matter of fact, that's expected results. Everyone should expect FSH levels to drop when you're taking estrogen or birth control. Now, you can make the argument that, hey, these are good results where we want to be before we start the stimulation. And that is true. And that's really the only time FSH is really brought down is to benefit your stimulation. But there is absolutely zero benefit of lowering FSH just to feel like it's lower. It's purely about the upregulation of the receptors. Overall, I appreciate how difficult it is as a patient. You know, you're getting these numbers thrown at you. You're reading on the internet about what numbers mean. You're hearing stories about people never getting pregnant with certain numbers and people getting pregnant with other numbers. And for you, I can't even imagine how difficult it must be. Even in this podcast, I'm not able to give you exact numbers because there isn't an exact number. All of these testing, that we do is purely to help us determine what would be the best stimulation for you. It's still not perfect. There are many times where I see FSH levels are high. I choose a protocol and it doesn't work as well as I thought it would. And then I adjust because that treatment during the IVF gave me more information than even the ovarian reserve testing. That was the proof is in the pudding. IVF is so stressful on its own. You don't need to add any more stress to it. And so what I would tell you about ovarian reserve testing is never be worried about the numbers. The more important question is what's your prognosis? And that really is reserved for doctors and nurse practitioners who can help explain it a little bit better by explaining to you that they're using those numbers and using your history to come up with a prognosis. But never be afraid of just a number. I say this all the time. All that ovarian reserve testing does is measure your ability to make extra eggs. It does not measure your ability to get pregnant. Even if there might be some associations, they are not causation. In the end, don't be worried about your FSH level being elevated. Yes, you should be worried, but don't be worried about getting it lower. More important is make sure you're working with a doctor who has worked with patients with high FSH levels. And when I say high, I'm talking 20 and above. Most doctors now treat patients with FSH levels between 14 and 18 without any issues. But there are some doctors who don't 
selectively treat patients with FSH levels above 20 any different than they treat other patients. And personally, I think that's wrong. Now, that's my opinion. Other doctors might have different opinions, but I do believe there are certain protocols that work better for those patients. And it's really a personal decision between you and your doctor. Sometimes it's even a financial decision between you and your doctor where you have to not do the treatment you might want because of financial reasons and have to use other treatments. But in the end, there are differences between patients who have FSH levels below 20 and those who have above 20. And I do believe there are certain practitioners that are going to be a little bit more suited for those patients than just the average fertility clinic. I think one of the most important things and that you always hear me say is talk to your doctor. Whether you think they're good at it or not, just ask them and say, hey, here's my FSH level. I'm worried about my ovarian reserve. Do I need to be worried about getting pregnant? And if they can look at you in the eye and say, I'm not worried about you getting pregnant. Yeah, it's going to be harder. We're going to have to use more medications. It might even cost more. But I feel you're going to do fine. Then I take a deep breath and believe them. Because it's not just a science of numbers. It is looking at the patient. It's looking at all those parameters to make decisions. So don't be worried about having that high FSH level and having to get it down. Stay positive and get pregnant. Hopefully you found this episode helpful. Maybe you can use this information or maybe you have a friend going through it or family member. Please let them know about it. As most of all, as I always say, if you love us, please give us a five-star review on your favorite medium. As always, keep coming back. I really look forward to talking to you again next week on Talk About Fertility Tuesdays.